Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Carter Emmart and I'm the director for astrovisualization at the American Museum of Natural History on this epic and historic day where we're returning um, to uh, space flight from the United States of America and from the um, launch site of Kennedy Space Center. But what we see in front of us right now is actually where we have been launching uh, for the past nine years up to the International Space Station from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, our partners in the International Space Station. Today, we're going to be looking at all of this using our software, Open Space. And uh, joining me on this journey is Jackie Faherty, who's a good friend of mine, and uh, she's an astronomer at the Hayden Planetarium. Um, Jackie, would you like to say a few words, please? Sure. Hi, everybody watching from home. I'm Jackie Faraday. As Carter said, I'm an astrophysicist. I do research on the stars for a living, but I am an avid fan of what is happening today. So I'm very excited to be uh, taking you on this tour with Carter as we uh, use this amazing software and show you a little taste, right, Carter, of what it might be like for an astronaut launching off today. Well, hopefully so, uh, Jackie. This uh, software open space allows us to really come and go and explore the universe and other uh, the other planets that we have good coverage of, thanks to our space program. Um, arguably, uh, right here, uh, the space uh, the whole space endeavor started uh, with the launch of the first human being, Yuri Gagarin, into space in 1961. And um, then we followed suit uh, with the Mercury program, we being the United States of America. But uh, today we're going to uh, really sort of explore this um, with a, another partner of us here, uh, who's our navigator. And that's Micah Achinapura. Micah is a developer for Open Space. Open Space is freely available. It's NASA, uh, NASA funded software, but we're developing it at the American Museum of Natural History Linshipping University in Sweden, University of Utah, and New York University. So it's a large collaborative international effort. What this is, we show data. These are pictures taken from space. What we see in front of us are the two um, moon pads. <laughs> These are for the N1 moon rocket, which didn't quite work out for the Soviet Union. And Micah, if we just pull, if we go sort of backwards here a little bit, uh, we might be able to see some of the other uh, launch facilities and then we're gonna rise up. Um, we're looking toward, toward the north here, the northern horizon. And you'll notice that uh, uh, typical for a launch site <laughs> is there are no houses around, there's no development. This is what's called the Kazakh steppe. This is uh, grasslands um, that are vast and, uh, and sort of unpopulated. And um, you want uh, a safety area around any launch facility. And as Micah sort of backs up here and in the lower part of the screen, we may be able to see um, some of the preparatory buildings similar as we have, as we'll see in just a minute or so over in Florida as well. And so this is really where um, space began. And uh, of course the Russians also launched Sputnik, which was the first satellite around Earth in 1957. So we're now going to rise up above and we're uh, um, getting higher and higher above this launch site, the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Um, rich history in launching uh, space, as we say. We start to see a line and that line is in the very upper left of, of your screen. Notice how the atmosphere thins out. It's only about 20 miles thick um, before it goes to black. It actually extends above that, but we don't see it, it's sort of black. And, and uh, so that sort of comes into why we put the International Space Station in an orbit, meaning going around the Earth, um, higher than what we see of just the atmosphere. All airliners, if you've ever been in an airplane, fly about midway through that atmosphere. They fly up in, in the stratosphere. So we're flying up, we see the Sear River, and over on the left is the remains of what's called the Aral Sea. It's a, a lake that's uh, an inland lake or the remains of it. Uh, a lot of it sort of dried up because the rivers that flow into it have been used uh, um, for agriculture. Far Further over to the left, we see the Caspian Sea. And now we see this line. That line illustrates the orbit or the path, the trail 
of the International Space Station. It goes 17,500 miles an hour to make it around the Earth every hour and a half. And um, so as we pull out, uh, we'll see a broader view. And Jackie, I was just wondering if you had any reflections on this as we pull out to see the whole global view here. Yeah, uh, and I should say that I'm monitoring the chat right now so I can see what folks are saying and their curiosities. <laughs> One of the things that they've made note of is that they're so used to at least the, the kids that are in this chat right now, we're thinking that we launch over water and we just showed them a very dry perspective when we were over the launch pad in Russia. And um, we're gonna take you down to it, kids, because uh, you're, you're thinking of Kennedy Space Center, which is where we're launching from today. So this is an amazing perspective that we're at um, from here. And we're about to take you to where the astronauts today will be launching from. So, so uh, Mike has actually uh, um, gotten the uh, time clock going, Jackie, and so we see the, uh, the Earth rotating. And so I mentioned that the space station goes around the Earth amazingly um, in just an hour and a half, in 90 minutes. And that means it makes 16 orbits every day. But if you're an astronaut on board the ISS, you would see the sunrise and sunset um, 16 times a day. So you might think of the day on the ISS as being about uh, 45 minutes and, the, and then the night. Um, but in this way, the orbit comes around and then the Earth is turning underneath it. So Micah's showing this. Now we see the orbit cutting across North America, just about between um, the United States and Canada. Uh, we, see some, we see clouds uh, we see the uh, Great Lakes underneath some of the clouds just going off the top of the screen. And we see Florida, the peninsula of Florida, um, sticking off the, the southeast coast of the U.S. And so we see this prominent, uh, um, you know, state of Florida sticking out. All the way down, we see at the bottom of the screen, uh, the nation of Cuba. Um, and then we also see um, the beautiful um, uh, Caribbean Sea and some of the, the blues of, of uh of there and now actually as we fade away we can see the continental shelf that's the light blue and the deeper blues of the deeper ocean in this high resolution map halfway up the, the the coast of florida there's the cape this is cape canaveral and it sticks out and as jackie was pointing out is that uh, we're used to seeing rockets fly out over water um in the case of russia they they didn't really have too good of an access to, or their east coast was so far away, they decided to launch from Kazakhstan. But here, um, the uh, space program in the late 50s, we began to launch um, from here. And you always want to launch eastward, which in this case is to the right. Why do we do that? Well, just previously, you saw when Micah had the, the time going forward, is that the Earth rotates in an eastward direction. We can use the momentum of the Earth rotating that way to actually um, help the satellite go into an orbit. And so that's why we put this at a safe place on the East Coast over water. And another thing, Jackie, you can talk to this a, a bit uh, you, because you're, you're a physicist, just that we want to be as close to the equator, don't we, in launching into space? Yeah, that's the best spots that you can be in when you're launching. I should say we're hovering over Kennedy here, which most people know is pretty far south for the United States. It's getting closer to equatorial in there. And Mike has got us hovering over the Kennedy Space Center, which uh, brings us back to today where we're going to see SpaceX, this private company, launch from one of these two launch pads that Carter will describe in a second off to the close to the coast there. and. I was at a launch in January at this very site where SpaceX, the private company that's partnering with NASA and launching two astronauts today, was doing one of their final tests to see if the Dragon capsule, which is carrying astronauts on it today, would make it safely away if in case there was anything that went wrong. And I watched them successfully abort the Dragon back in January from this very, very site here. So the, the launch facilities here uh, include uh, a very tall building. We see the shadow of it kind of going up to the upper, and just a, there's a building toward the center. Mike is zooming in on it. That's the vehicle assembly building. Famously, this is where, uh, this is the building that was put together in the 1960s by NASA to 
house as many as four moon rockets at a time. And then, <clears throat> and so then just to the lower right of it, we see sort of in green water, and that's called the turning pond because the uh, rocket boosters would be made in places like Alabama and Louisiana, and they'd be then floated by barge and in the inland waterway brought here, offloaded, and then stacked together to make the rockets. And uh, Jackie, your, your press site, Micah, could you zoom in perhaps maybe just a little bit closer um, by this pond, and there's a famous clock that faces out to the launch pads, which uh, we'll talk about in just a second, which are off to the right. And uh, as we come in, we can see a silhouette of the space shuttle, much bigger than the space shuttle actually was, but they, they sort of do that. You can see it from above, like from an airplane. But the uh, Micah says just below the center of screen there are basically the press area, and this is where the, uh, the lawn just off to, to the right in front of the water is where everybody was uh, gathers for launches and to, uh, to view from there. Carter, I can say too, when I was there, they actually wouldn't let us in this area because it was an abort um, test. And so I watched from a little bit further away, which I think a lot of people might be trying to watch from today as well. I was watching from the visitor center for those ah. that can safely watch. We're also getting questions in the chat Dennis from Tennessee was just asking about the weather today and what kinds of conditions they're looking for. Um, one thing I can say is when I watched Dragon launch in January, the launch was supposed to happen in the early morning at 7 a.m. and it was delayed, delayed, and delayed as they were looking at the wind conditions uh, on that particular day. So you want calm winds, the safest possible conditions that you can have to launch something very quickly. And so we were delayed for about three and a half hours that day. We have no idea right now, neither Carter nor I knows um, what's going to happen, but hopefully the weather conditions will hold for today and we'll have calm winds and clear skies. Yeah, you really need those, those two elements. And uh, um, we're, we're, Mike is bringing us out now uh, to the launch pads. Uh, 39A, which is where we're launching from, and above it is 39B, but there's kind of a copy of this. SpaceX got the contract uh, to be launching from this very famous launch site. This is where Apollo 11 launched to the moon. This is where most of the Apollo launches occurred. And you can see it's very close to the breakers of the, of the beach, just off to the right. And so this, these are essentially mountains of concrete to take the pounding of the rocket as it lifts off. And what looks like a dual lane highway is actually what's called the crawler way. And um, after we were done with the Apollo program, of course, we transitioned to the space shuttle program, and which ended nine years ago in July of, of 2011, STS-135, the last flight up to the uh, uh, space station of the US space shuttle, and it was retired. And um, uh, one of the uh, astronauts, uh, Hurley, is, is actually, uh, you know, was on that last flight, actually, um, both astronauts going up today uh, with SpaceX are NASA astronauts and have been to uh, been up on the space shuttle to the uh, um, to the ISS in the past. Um, I think it's also good to note, Carter, that these two guys are experienced. They're male astronauts heading up. Women also have been to space, um, not in the same numbers that men have been into space, but we're definitely hoping to see any young girls that are watching this also get inspired for their own desires to go into space. But the two men that are going up today are pretty seasoned veterans, have both been to space and have been training with within SpaceX so that they know what the Dragon capsule, which is the really special capsule that we're talking about today that SpaceX is launching, is going to be sending up. We've had a couple of questions in here, Carter, about mm -hmm. how many astronauts, I know we've said it already, but there are just two astronauts going up, and how many they're meeting on the International Space Station, which right now is three astronauts for mm -hmm. Wilson, who was just asking that uh, question. I'm actually I'm actually surprised that NASA didn't send a man and a woman on, on this uh, on this particular journey. But uh, anyway, that's it's a very good point. Uh, we just had the on the ISS. We'll talk about it when we get there. But uh, um, how we we just had the the first all female uh, spacewalk, 
And um, I think you know one of those astronauts, Jackie. <laughs> I wish I knew them personally. They are two of my sheroes, um, Jessica and Christina, that they're, I can give first names in part because they're almost so famous. You might have been seeing them all over the news right now as they've been talking quite a bit about this mission. And those two women have certainly been um, breaking some records, one of which was doing a spacewalk on the International Space Station uh, very recently. This was just a couple months ago. So let's let's go up to the space station uh, now, and and uh, Mike is poised to. Uh, uh, we're looking sort of north. We're looking along the coast, and uh, we're going to rise up slowly here. Um, once again, sort of uh, with that view uh, uh, of the launch facilities. Um, but this is kind of if you were to look out the window, this is the sort of view you'd have. Micah, could we maybe even just pan a little bit uh, uh, to the left, and we'll 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 see. Okay, well, we're, we're pulling out nicely here. This is great. You know, Carter, as we also leave the planet, we should note that we're doing this very smoothly in uh, the open space software. We cannot simulate for, simulate for folks who are certainly talking about this in the chat, uh, what it feels like to lift off of the planet uh, and experience this acceleration as you start to move faster and faster. And that classic feeling that maybe some people have experienced on a roller coaster um, or in the Tower of Terror at Disney where you get dropped and you feel this <laughs> force in your belly. Um, I think, Carter, you had a great uh, line about what an astronaut you had heard we, say we, once about the launch. We had the, we had the great pleasure of having one of the astronauts, um, Story Musgrave, who, uh, who, uh, who led the repair of the Hubble Space Telescope in its, in its first uh, need for repairs. So you may recall that the Hubble launched and had uh, some problem with the, the optics. And so they had to go fix that. And uh, so uh, Story came and uh, spent the afternoon with us in, in our offices uh, at, the, at the planetarium. And um, uh, somebody asked him, what about the launch? And he said, uh, he looked at us, he said, Nobody likes the launch. It's kind of like being in a train wreck for 20 minutes, <laughs> given how it shakes. So certainly exciting, um, but the astronauts train very hard for this. And um, um, a lot of them have been test pilots and have had military careers. And um, so they know what to do in emergencies or in, uh, in difficult circumstances, training, training, training. And um, so um, the excitement of that launch leads to then the weightlessness and the floating around in space and the view from space. Our world is the most colorful of all the planets. Um, it's the only one covered with liquid water. The beauty of the clouds, the beauty of the green veil of vegetation over the earth. This is a very special planet. Let's come up to where we've been been and since 1998, the first modules that were launched, uh, uh, the two, uh, first uh, piece of it uh, was uh, Zarya, um, stands for Dawn, it's a Russian word, and so the, the Russians put up uh, the Zarya uh, module first, and so we're going to come in on the ISS now, and Mike is uh, uh, steering us in, and uh, we also see the coast of Africa coming up, which is um, so clear. Um, we, we talked about this in our field trip Earth, but how the Sahara Desert is, is uh, so clear. We can see all the geography and that contrast to the blue ocean is, is extremely beautiful. Carter, we're getting a lot of questions from kids, I think, that want to go to space right now because maybe they're inspired by this imagery. But one question in particular right now from JLo's eight-year-old daughter is what will the astronauts be doing on the International Space Station? And so as we approach um, you'll start to get a sense of what this place looks like. But important is that this is a space laboratory and where you can do some of these experiments up there are similar to what kids might be doing in class. You see how seeds grow. We check to see the way any kind of reaction, might, different kinds of reactions happen within the space station where you're in this moment of weightlessness. And so the, sci the scientists that are up there are both maintaining this home, but also conducting biology experiments, chemistry experiments, physics experiments, and so their daily duties are being scientists up here. And this is, this is a, a real key point about sort of why do people go? I mean, we have tremendous robotic missions to the outer planets 
We've only sent humans to the moon and that was 50 years ago. But really the human element is, is it carries literally our hearts and our minds into space. And these astronauts are representatives of humanity for all of us. Um, we can all relate to stories just as we still relate to the story of Odysseus and um, the, you know, the ancient Greeks and their stories. And it inspires us. And so to have a discussion with an astronaut is to have a discussion with someone who has gone to a new realm. And this is why I think we send people into space. And, and uh, so here on the space station, it's about, uh, Micah came up nice and slowly. It's about, the, it's a little bit larger than a football field. And here is Zvezda, um, this module that is closest to us with its own little solar panels that are sticking out. And uh, that stands for star. That's a, the Russian word for star, Zvezda. And Zarya, um, just ahead of it, uh, was the first piece. I mentioned that. And Zarya is the Russian word for dawn. And Micah, if we come a little closer into the center of this, we'll come up to the first component. We see fairly standardized cylinders. Um, and uh, so these standardized cylinders were um, launched then by the space shuttle and brought up and they met the Russian components and began building out um, this International Space Station. And um, so it's much more than just the US and the Russians. We'll be showing you some uh, modules from the European Space Agency and from the Japanese uh, Space Agency called JAXA. But we're coming up now on that first uh, sort of module ahead of Zarya is called Unity. And it was called that because it would then be the unifier module by which all the rest of the space station would be built upon. And off to the right is an amazing part of the space station, the Tranquility Module. And uh, beautifully named, uh, the Sea of Tranquility, of course, where we landed with Apollo 11. And um, then below it, see that conical uh, shape? Micah can bring us a little closer to that. Unfortunately, we have uh, the windows closed, but we'll see the padded covers to these windows. This is the bay window on the space station. The space station has some smaller windows to look out of, but this was specially designed so the astronauts could look at the Earth and look down. We're seeing an image uh, that is taken by NASA satellites that we put together in this open space software. And uh, if you're interested in open space, you can download this for yourself at uh, openspaceproject.com. But also in our chat, we have some of our open space team, so you can ask questions about that but hopefully you might be inspired to download this and, and sort of uh, explore the universe along with us. But here are um, the windows. There's seven windows on this thing. Carter, uh, as we're, we're staring at the windows, you know I have to say this part, which I love. I love it in open space. Um, the view that you have as an astronaut is so unprecedented in that curvature of the earth and looking down upon the planet the way they do. I encourage folks that are watching this to follow astronauts on social media, on, for instance, Twitter, or Instagram. They post the most epic photographs from these positions. And not only is it the planet that's so amazing, but you look around and you have a dark sky and there are stars around. And even though it's seemingly daytime below you, you're, you've got this epic nighttime sky. So if there's one thing over everything that I'm jealous of that astronauts get is the view that they have from here. So there, there are many components to the, the space station and, and uh, boy, it would, it would fill a whole program just to talk about that. But we'll give you a quick little tour. These standardized modules uh, that I mentioned that were sized to go inside the cargo bay of, of the um, various, the fleet of space shuttles that uh, the US operated are 15 feet in diameter. So think of two tall people, one standing on the shoulders of the other. It's sort of the diameter uh, of, or in excess of, uh, uh, of, of that uh, essentially. So 15 feet is, is large but inside you have a lot of equipment and so forth. So the, the space inside the space station, the living quarters are sort of like corridors uh, between uh, various instruments and so on. The module that we see in front of us now rotating around, that's uh, Columbus. And that was from the European Space Agency. We see the docking adapter in the middle. 
And off to the right is the Japanese Hibo or uh, the Japanese experiment module. And it has its own sort of palette of outside external instruments as well as uh, its own um, articulation arm. Notice as well, there's another arm, a big mechanical robotic arm to the, to the left. And um, this is uh, a part of a development of technology um, from the Canadian Space Agency that's been with um, back to the space shuttle program all along. And uh, the Canadian Space Agency specializes in robotics. And so, Mike, if we come a little closer to the, uh, the mechanical arm, we'll actually see proudly on, on the uh, mechanical arm, uh, we'll see Canada, we'll see the word Canada, and they actually have a little Canadian flag. So here we're seeing that um, through the Columbus module, the various um, contributors to the European Space Agency, the um, Japanese uh, experiments uh, and, and their module, as well as the US and Russian um, counterparts. Carter, I think it's also good to note that um, uh, since we've showed the docking area here, is that that's the other thing folks should look for when the launch happens, which hopefully it'll happen. We get a lot of questions about when it's supposed to happen. We're hoping for today, um, just after the four o'clock hour and Eastern Standard Time. Um, but also they should, they should look for that moment when we dock with the International Space Station. That's the other moment that I think is super exciting to see happen. Um, and Dragon will launch today, but it's going to do a little bit of low Earth orbit to get stable before it docks. And yeah, the, um, the black area right there in the middle is where they dock. Just wanted to point that out, Jackie. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So this is a great visual of what it would look like. So you can imagine yourself on that capsule right now uh, coming in. Another question I want to get in here too from Parker and Sienna in Harlem. They're asking about how old you have to be to be on this International Space Station. And I just checked the ages of the three astronauts that are up there right now. And it looks like there's the youngest that's on there right now is 34 years of age. I think the youngest that's ever been to space is just over 25, 26 year old. So kids out there that are uh, teenagers or younger, not quite yet to go. But, you know, once you're in your in 30s, especially 34, that's how um, you could be up there on the International Space Station. Um, I'll just mention that uh, we see the solar power as well as we now you can see these solar panels and they generate, uh, uh, I was looking this up on the NASA website, I was curious about how much electricity is, is generated and they, uh, the claim is that uh, they could, you could power about 40 US homes on uh, what they're generating with these high tech uh, solar panels that are up there. Um, they're off to two sides because of you saw where the, where we dock um, and the space shuttle um, would fly in and uh, it flies in by using thrusters, little rocket firings. And so that thrust goes out and you don't want that to uh, uh, create sort of a breeze of, of gas that's coming out. Uh, there's a, a space, of course, um, <laughs> is, is a, a void. They're charged particles, things like this, but it's pretty much a vacuum. But still, when you, you fire the thrusters, you could disturb the solar panel. So they put them on both sides like that. Jackie, uh, you, you, um, uh, you've read uh, uh, Commander Kelly's book and just about what uh, people are doing on the space station and all that. I just, I, I thought I'd ask you about that. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of questions in the chat too about what the astronauts are doing on the space station. And um, Scott Kelly, who Carter just mentioned is quite a famous astronaut, him and his brother actually were both astronauts. And um, Scott Kelly was sent for what was famously called the year in space. And as much as anything, there were, he was part of the experiment. It was an experiment on how space might change his body in relation to say his twin brother's body who was back on the planet. But he spent his time famously working on these science experiments. He tended to some mold experiments that were up there. He tended to some plants that they were trying to see if that they could maintain up there. Uh, and I think that this is a lot of what they get to do. The other thing that they get to do, which he speaks of, and which is, is I'm going to repeat what I'm going to encourage people to do, is that they show people what it looks like from space. 
they reach out to the general public and so that you can see these views of what it looks like from the International Space Station. So the kinds of things, there's all scientists up there on that ISS, Carter. Well, and I'll just mention one little anecdote, which was um, uh, Charles Bolden, who was the NASA administrator um, during uh, the Obama administration, uh, um, came to uh, our museum and we were in the dome. Leyland Melvin, who was the head of NASA's education, um, was with him and he came up afterwards and he said to us, he said, uh, what you just showed was the closest to being in space and he hesitated. I said, since you were in space, he said, yes. I said, I said, that's the greatest compliment we could get. So while we're not floating around inside the Hayden Planetarium, at least uh, um, the graphics are such that they're based on the images um, from the satellites. We see an accurate model and all that. And so our goal is to share with you all what it's like to be there. So, Carter, uh, one other question I have to get in here too, sure. because um, <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's pertinent today, and NASA did send a tweet about this. It's from Eric Martinez, and he was asking if NASA did really say something about Tom Cruise going into space to film something. And they did say that, and it is possible <laughs> that, yes, um, this imagery that we're showing you is fantastic. I think it's movie quality, but it is potentially true that um, Tom Cruise might be headed to the place that I think Carter and I are very jealous that he would get to go. <laughs> Yeah, mission possible. So anyway, <laughs> um, uh, it's 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 a if it raises the awareness of space, I think that's perhaps a good thing. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I am jealous. Uh, Tom's an actor. <laughs> I work at the planetarium. <laughs> you know, come on, let's all go. Um, but uh, from this position uh, and and visual, uh, it seems as though the only thing up there is the ISS really in what we call lower earth orbit, you've seen that it's really just above, a bit above the, uh, enough above the atmosphere that, uh, that we don't encounter drag from the atmosphere. So uh, the space station's nicely placed, but this is also the home of many more satellites and they're all moving at nearly 18,000 miles an hour. So if one hits you going the, the other direction, that could be a bad day, um, we won't talk about that, but the distances between these things are usually so great. But I thought uh, perhaps we should show some of the, you know, our counterparts out there. Now these are not with people, um, but uh, these are the instruments. These are our satellites, our ro robots in space that monitor weather, they uh, um, are relays for telecommunications, um, they're doing various experiments and uh, observations for military and so on. Um, but just even within low Earth orbit, and I'm, I'm gonna ask Micah if we could actually advance time a little bit so we'll see them in motion. Um, so in other words, we would run the clock faster and if we do, we'll, we'll maybe see that in a little bit of dynamical motion. Carter, we should also note that this is not a complete sample of what is up there. Of course, there is a lot more material. We actually have a question from Sarah Croker about how, has anything like a meteor or some space junk ever say hit the International Space Station? And there's, there's a, a really fun thing you can look for once we start to go back to museums. If you go to the Smithsonian, you can see parts of the Hubble Space Telescope that got brought back. And um, that was certainly hit by teeny tiny little meteorites, micrometeorites. Uh, and so anything that's up there, and we're showing you a significant amount of material, but not the whole of the material, is actually quite dangerous. Um, so a fleck of paint can be dangerous up there. So we really need to pay attention to the amount of material that is launched into space. You, you can see, and that's a very good point, Jackie. It's just that uh, the smaller things are, the more numerous they are. Um, but uh, also, at, at, and we have satellites that are sort of in different um, classes. And, and Micah's backed away now to where we can see this very obvious belt around the equator. Um, and some have called it the Clark Belt for the science and science fiction writer, Arthur C. Clark, who in 1945 suggested, if you put a satellite above the equator at about 22,000 miles, 
its orbital period matches the rotation rate of Earth. So these are geosynchronous satellites. This is an ideal place to put relay satellites uh, so that from the Earth, they just always seem to be right above your head, you know, <laughs> and uh, you can just aim your satellite dish uh, at the satellite uh, and, uh, you know, uh, basically transmit and receive signals. This distance, in fact, is one-tenth the distance to the moon. And um, the space station is just now a little line around the Earth. And 10 times this distance of the geosynchronous satellites is our moon. And that's, you know, we haven't been to the moon since 1972. So it's almost 50 years ago that we left the moon. And um, so uh, we thought we would give you a vision, a little bit of where we'll be going in the future. And it seems as though the momentum of the space program, uh, the, certainly the US program, the Chinese are also, uh, have had a series of missions leading up to a possible human flight in the future. Um, but this destination of the moon and returning to the moon uh, when the case of the, the United States goes. Um, and uh, so there are various plans. And uh, so Mike has backed away so far that we now see an orbit in gray of the moon around the earth. We also see a line coming out from the earth itself and that's the earth's orbit around the sun. Of course, we go around the sun in one year and the moon goes around the earth in one month or one month. <laughs> and, but we're now going to run actually a little bit of a replay of, um, we just reoriented to show you um, the first time that humans left the earth and it really sort of really left the earth. And so Mike is going to pull in a little closer and we can now see the line stretching out from Earth that was carrying the Apollo 8 spacecraft. Uh, the three Apollo 8 astronauts are the first humans to actually go to the moon. They didn't land on the moon. They went to the moon and then orbited 10 times and then came home. Um, and uh, But they got to the moon on Christmas Eve of 1968. Notice how you don't aim at the moon, you aim where the moon will be. And that's why they call it a rendezvous. You both meet there at the same point in time. And uh, at, uh, at about three quarters or farther out from the earth, the gravity of the moon takes over and the spacecraft starts to fall toward the moon. They fire its engine to put it into orbit and then they went around and then came back. It took about three and a half days to get to the moon. Carter, that is a sounds both like a long and a short amount of time as we're getting a lot of questions in the chat about wanting to go, but how long would it take? So just to repeat, just three-ish days to get there and then you do your uh, experiments, whatever that's gonna be, and then you can come back. So something that might be on people's minds is that SpaceX, which is this private company that Elon Musk has made it very, very clear of his desire to see humans in space exploring. And so this is, there's a big door opening today, if, even if it's just historical, uh, in that um, we're going to space with a private company and that, that might soon very well be a reality that some of us might be able to take a trip to the moon. And he also wants to go to Mars. So we, we thought we would show you in this, uh, in one, one last sort of, um, respective of how far these distances are. The, the, the moon uh, is, is 240,000 miles away. The moon is a thousand times the distance that the uh, International Space Station orbits above the Earth. Mars is the next planet out. Here we can see the sun, we see the, the, we see the inner planets of Mercury closest to the sun, and then Venus. Uh, Venus actually comes closer to us than Mars, but Mars is the fourth planet out. It takes about two years to go around. We go around in a year. And um, from this perspective, Mike is realigning so that we can uh, show you basically the path of Mars 2020, hopefully to be launched uh, um, from uh, Kennedy Space Center this July to Mars and see how the path diverts away from Earth. So we see the Earth's orbit, the Earth's trail, we see the trail of Mars 2020, and then we see Mars. And so Mars 2020 zooms out, and once again, just like Apollo 8, it launches to where Mars will be. They rendezvous together, and it takes about eight months. I think it's launching in July and gets there around mid-February, and uh, hopefully if all goes well. 
So that's quite a bit longer, eight months. For those of you that are asking, how long is the longest space travel that we're thinking of? Eight months to get to Mars, and then you're going to do your experiments there and come back. So it's a pretty big chunk of time. We've got now questions coming in on all sorts of things. Um, one of which that I think we can also address here is how do you become an astronaut? <laughs> we have to worry about such things as, uh, uh, well, becoming an astronaut has traditionally been the realm of, um, it's risky to be a, a, an astronaut, uh, but uh, those who love flight and uh, typically have had military careers um, that the uh, requirements uh, to uh, be a fighter pilot are similar to um, requirements to be a test pilot. And uh, today, I uh, just want to remind everyone that today, today's uh, f anticipated flight is a test flight. And this is why we're working with astronauts who have been there before. And um, so um, most of the uh, astronauts, or the, the original Apollo astronauts, um, had grown up and several of them had a license to fly airplanes before they had a license to drive a car. Um, and also a lot of them came from farm country um, out where they knew how to repair things. Uh, just if, you know, if the combine breaks and, and uh, maybe you won't get home to dinner unless you know how to fix the engine on the thing. And so a lot of them had practical knowledge, loved to fly. And uh, if you love to fly and, uh, uh, want to learn how to do that, but also uh, if you're not just a pilot and you're a scientist, Jackie, I mean, you're an astrophysicist. Uh, uh, become, uh, become the best scientist you can be and you may be sent up to do experiments in space. I should also say, I, I happen to have my pilot's license as well and I'm, I'm a degree in physics and I, I don't actually want to go to space right now. I think I'd like to see Crew Dragon successfully dock uh, but one um, extra bit on here as well on this is that when the movie The Martian came out, um, the number of people that applied for the space program skyrocketed. So folks should be watching this launch also for the inspiration. And I hope to see, you know, go online and look for that astronaut application if you're eligible. Put your name in there. Who knows? Maybe you're going to be the one that's headed here to the moon as, we're, as Mike is taking us in to the moon here. Maybe it'll be you. The astronaut applications, uh, when they do open, um, sign on and get your name in there. I just, I wanted to mention that uh, uh, one of my high school interns um, has gone off to do lunar research and a PhD program about the moon. And she introduced me to her roommate who was just selected for the Artemis program. Artemis, the twin sister of Apollo, the goddess of the moon. Apollo was the one who carried, you know, of course, we know as our mission to the moon, but really was the sun god. And Artemis is the god of the moon, goddess of the moon. And um, that most likely uh, the first uh, human to uh, step foot on the moon in the future will be a, will be a female astronaut. So. Yep. And uh, that's an important note also as we're going around here, Carter, that um, when they were talking about this moment that we're at today for this, this, this commercialized crew going up, um, the various administrations, the Obama administration and the Bush administration, which kind of started all of this in, into effect, they wanted a destination. And so the destination of the moon has become a place that they're looking for. So Artemis, which who knows what the year will be when we go, 2024, 2025, maybe a couple of years from now. Um, but this might be the site of where we will see that first female astronaut step foot upon another planetary surface. That's right. And um, Mike is bringing us up to uh, um, the, the good ship Apollo 8. Uh, and uh, when it uh, uh, had its historic, uh, I think on the fourth orbit or so, it, it, it saw uh, it was oriented in just such a way <laughs> that Bill Anders, who was assigned to be photographing everything on, on the voyage, looked out and said, my God, that's beautiful. And uh, what he saw was the earth rising above the edge of the moon. Um, and it, it sort of, uh, it was a moment of realization perhaps for the entire world. Uh, this image uh, was quite famous, um, but uh, really what it sort of put everything in perspective. Um, we 
put a lot into going to the moon and rising above us, uh, above the moon was, was us, was the earth, all of history that we've known, uh, everything um, that has ever been that we know of has been on that planet. That is us. And it's up to us to figure out how to live together, work together, and maintain our system. It was an image that gave birth to uh, the environmental movement. We really want to um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Jackie, I, uh, this has been a lot of fun to present with you. And, and uh, I know that uh, we, we have some I guess a survey and a quiz that we- That's uh, right, yep. Yeah. So for folks that um, we're about to end the program, but um, once we close the program, there'll be a survey and a quiz, a fun quiz for you to take to see what you've learned. Um, and also if you're interested, so tune in for that launch, which hopefully is gonna be happening later today. We will also be coming back. Um, myself, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Mike Shara, We'll be back at four o'clock for some commentary on the actual launch on our Facebook uh, channel. So tune in for that if you want. But otherwise, Carter, this is always fun to do space visualizations with you. You are such an avid enthusiast about what's out there. And I hope people just I hope especially kids are excited. And we might be speaking to some of the net, the future astronauts. Yeah. And I, I just I also want to give a shout out to uh um, my, my student, uh, Suchindram, who had prepared the NASA model for us today, and he's a high school student with the Bergen County Academies, and uh, um, I've had a, a long stream of, of students from them, and they've worked with us, and, and that's just been tremendous um, to add on what you can hopefully all enjoy at home uh, by downloading Open Space and exploring along with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>